that work? Can you hear me? You probably can hear me now. It looks like my thing might be gone. Robert, can you hear me? <laughs> Disaster. No sound? Oh, you got me now. Man, if I tap this microphone, does this work? Because it says it's going through the camera audio and not this, which is crazy. What's up? Oh my god, everybody's here. Thank you guys. I'm sorry about the... They sure don't make it easy to set up audio on these things. Um, thank you. I want to force myself to be here uh, to do this. Um, the audio might break again when I switch the screen over, but today we have a little bit of agenda. I'm supposed to do a podcast interview on Monday with the guys from Stitchdown. And if you're not familiar with Stitchdown, they have a really awesome um, uh, podcast. I think they call it the Stitchdown Shoecast, and I'm a fan. So, sounds like camera audio. Yeah, it's probably coming through there then and not this guy. You'd be hearing these tapping if it was working. Bummer. It's weird. I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe uh, let's add a device. No. Did I make it worse? I think it made it worse. Oh well. Back to no sound. <laughs> so much for this. Well, um, if you like that, you're going to love this because I'm going to keep it going. <laughs> We're going to keep going. Uh, I'm going to show you this other screen here, but the mic's going to go out. So bear with me here. back here can you can you guys actually hear me for real so I'm gonna go through that slide and the goal today for me is to practice uh, this for this interview and I would really like to know if there are certain things that we that I start to touch on that you want to know more about so I can elaborate now and on this podcast because for me like I think I'm just too familiar with some of these topics that I just take it for granted. So I want to run through the uh, tanning process today, starting from the hair on the hide all the way to uh, the measuring machine at the tannery and then it going out of the door. And then all the steps in between, we'll try to do like a quick, a quick, um, just a quick run through, through everything. I've also had some people in recent videos ask me about uh, an update on some boots that I have. Uh, they want to update on the fiber natural shell plain toe boots, which I love and I brought them here. I just ran out of time. I wanted to do that today. They also wanted an update on the Grant Stone diesel boots and natural Chrome XL, which are also over here and they're really nice. And I'm wearing 
trench boots right now for the stitch down patina, patina thunderdome so all those are really great i want to make a follow-up video the vibergs are two years the the um the oak streets are one month and the grant stones are one year so we've got a good range of stuff and i can talk about how i enjoy each of them but let's run through this and then at the end here i've got a special surprise hopefully you know audio works well enough where you can hear me um let's start off talking about uh, a little bit of story let me tell you my story so um what was it gosh 15 16 years ago now i was a musician playing in musical theater as a job and i was going to school to be a musician i didn't know anything about leather and i moved to chicago and ended up working at the tannery as a summer job so before i started working there i thought everything that was leather was just one thing i didn't understand that there was a difference and i thought all leather was brown and that you know it was a singular item called leather but i've come to realize after working there for so long that there's really an infinite range of possibilities when it comes to, to leather. And there are so many different things that will change uh, the characteristics of that final product that I would call a piece of leather. So we're gonna start off with the hide. So when you receive a hide, the hair is still on as if it just came off the animal. And all that's been done has been salted and cured so it won't rot and turn into dirt. But the question there is, you know, why might you choose one animal over another? And I see a lot of talk from people saying that they think that certain animals have more water resistance or, or certain properties like that. But the biggest, there's a couple of things that are inherent to each animal that's a little bit different that you may or may not want. So the most common leathers that you see are made out of bovine. And even in the category of bovine, there's a couple different animals. So the males are the steers. There's also bulls. And then there are cows, and the cows and steers are quite different. The most common one you see at Horween are actually steer hides. The steer hides tend to be plumper and more thick, but you have to purchase them specifically uh, in specific extra heavyweights if you want something like a belt. Because you can't just buy a steer hide and expect to get a 8 to 9 ounce thickness or even thicker uh, just from picking a normal steer. Not all of them are thick enough to be made into a belt. Or on the other end, the cows are quite thin, and the bellies of the cows are, they have babies, so their bellies are uh, a different shape, just physically, but also they tend to be a little bit more loose and fibrous. The other, probably the biggest thing about the hides is the older the animal is, the more chances it has to be scuffed up and scarred in the field. So for me, you know, I've caught myself and had some scars. Those are the types of things, if an animal rubs up against a barbed wire fence, you'll start to see those scars. The other thing is, is some ranchers will brand their animals. So you can actually purchase hides with or without brands and there's a premium for getting them without the brands. Um, the other thing is, if you guys have any questions on hides, let me know. Uh, the other animals that I'm very familiar with are like horse hides, which are pretty unique. In fact, horse hides along with all of the other equine animals are the only types of hides where you can find that unique yeah shell cordovan membrane in the hind quarter of the animal and that's like i said it's unique to all equine animals so you'll find it on donkeys and zebras and mules as, as well as horses you have to also remember that you don't find it much on zebras uh, or even mules or donkeys because they're typically not being bred for food where horse uh, as an american we might find that strange but horses actually uh, raised for meat uh, which is Again, not really eaten in uh, North America here. Um, but all the animals, this is sort of a byproduct of the meat industry. Uh, and that's how tanneries have, has, have always been. If they're sort of just an industry of byproducts. And I find that pr to be pretty interesting. So I once asked the tanner at Horwin, what's the hardest thing to tan? And he said, fish. And uh, he said it's just very delicate and very gentle. But there's no inherent uh, characteristics to leather. Like I have, um, I did a video on the beaver tail, and somebody said, "Well, is that beaver tail more water resistant?" Honestly, I don't know, but I couldn't imagine that it would be. The water resistance is not in the skin itself. You're just talking about a mess of fibers of, and collagen uh, in the skin that don't have any inherent properties at this point because that's that's what we're going to be doing later on in the tanning process. So hopefully that is a little helpful on hides. If you wanna know more about hides, hit me a question. Uh, that's why I'm here again today is maybe I'm missing some conversations 
uh, in the hide thing. Um, there's also stuff like uh, you know, bison, which is pretty similar to the steers, but they're more wrinkly and stuff. It can get pretty detailed, uh, but generally speaking, they're, the inherent things that you're looking for in the hides are the, the cleanliness of the hide, the shape, and how big the area is of the hide, and how thick it might be. Those are the things you're trying to purchase for. So once you receive the hide in, they need to start to remove the hair and to cure it. And so at that point, if you don't do anything, that hide's gonna start to rot and eventually it will turn into dirt. And the tannery's job is to take that infinitely variable hide and turn it into the same product every time. So for example, um, Chrome XL. Uh, if, if you want to sell Chrome XL to Alden and they wanna make a brown Chrome XL boot, I can't send them different versions of Chrome Excel every time because they would have a really hard time selling that product to the customer who's expecting one thing. They need a very consistent product. And each hide that comes in is completely random and variable. So it's a specific and uh, pretty large challenge. Uh, hey, Noah, what's up, guys? Uh, Noah said, rocking the natural M's fat Herbie right now. I am too. I've got my M's tall Herbie, uh, which this is the first tall Herbie I've worn. Really like this. And we should talk about this too in a moment. So the first step that they do after they receive the hide is to remove the hair and to cure it. And that's the first pro process is called tanning, which is a little bit of a misnomer because you're not really imparting any tannins into the leather uh, in the very initial stages. You're, you're just sort of curing it and sort of like how you would make a, a pickle. You're, you're going to make it so it doesn't change state. Um, so, and then the second stage of tanning uh, after you've cured it, is to start to pull out the fats and oils that are going to rot and deteriorate. Um, and then uh, you can sort of rebind all these fibers and the collagen with different materials. And the, the two most common ways that you'll see the first initial tanning being done are with chrome tanning and veg tanning. And there are, there are several other methods, but chrome tanning and veg are the two most common that you'll probably see most often. Now, chrome tanning, you're taking, uh, if, if you imagine and visualize the hide as sort of like a bowl of spaghetti, all these little fibers just sort of all over the place and there's voids in between them. The chrome molecules, it's a salt, will bind those fibers together and they'll start to fill in the voids in between and it will, it will create a strengthening bond between all the collagen. And veg tanning is a similar way, although it's a little bit less strong of a bond. It's sort of like, and Esteban, the tanner at Horween also, explained this to me in a perfect way. He said for me to think of chrome tanning as sort of like a like a cyborg, like a wolverine has uh, metal claws on like a human skeleton. You're sort of binding organic material with metal, and it creates a, a quite a bit of strength and heat resistance. Where the veg tanning, you're actually using natural tree bark, so it's it's almost like turning that organic hide into a partial piece of wood which is very interesting and that's also why, maybe that's not why, but a characteristic of the veg tan leather, they tend to darken and change more dramatically than chrome tan stuff and I think that's because it's a little bit more like wood. And then there are other tanning methods. One of the most recent uh, technologies is pretty fascinating. They're, they're starting to use fallen olive leaves from olive trees, that's a renewable resource, where veg tanning, you're actually using tree barks um, that are non-renewable. So it's pretty interesting the technology change. Veg tanning technology is a couple thousand years old, let's call it 2,000 years old, or chrome tanning is 200 years old. And now we've got some brand new stuff like olive tan and there's other materials that you can use to bind those fibers together. So they're still learning new ways to tan leather. Now once that leather has been tanned, we're going to move on to the most important part is to figure out what you're going to make out of it. What product are you going to make? And there's a stage here that's called blue sorting. Let me flip over the screen just to show you where we're at. My mic might not work here, but we're on the third red box uh, as I flip this over. So <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me when I flip that over, but we're on grading and splitting right now. So the most important part for, in my mind is this initial grading. Uh, while the leather is still wet, we're going to determine which route it will go down to because, like I said before, not every hide is thick enough to make a belt. 
um, and you you don't want to remove too much thickness to make a, a thinner leather if you want to make a garment leather you would never want to start off with something that's super thick and to cut off a lot of the substance to make a thinner leather because you lose a lot of the strength by removing so much material so you want to pick a, a, a product uh, or you want to pick the leather to be as roughly close to the final thickness at this stage and the other thing that we're doing or that a tannery will do at this first wet sort is to take a look at the grain clarity because some products uh, like a baseball glove is a really good example has no finish on it at all it's what we call a naked leather so any little imperfection that they see at this stage you're going to see on a glove and most baseball glove leathers you'll find to be very very clean and there are other leathers like I said for belts that you might be sorting for thickness so we're sorting for clarity and thickness and there are so many different products that they have to keep in mind to sort for it becomes a, a pretty large challenge and the person that does that job is uh, has to be very very good they can sort of make the tannery go out of business uh, if they do a bad job uh, and the second step there is we're going to take uh, a very sharp knife and thin down the leather to an even thickness and this is the first stage called splitting there's a couple topics in here that are super super important in splitting and this is where a couple it's very weird that this one little piece of the chain of the process has made a lot of marketing terms so splitting is again where you take your normal thickness of leather and you're just sort of removing a small amount from underneath to get that thickness to be even everywhere. It's sort of like using a plane in wood uh, when you're doing woodworking. So splitting has created a couple of terms that are I find to be very troublesome. Uh, I'll just name a couple here. We've got full grain, top grain, and genuine leather. And I find those terms um, to be not completely descriptive and they're often used in ways that are deceptive. So full grain leather, means leather that has not been polished or sanded on the grain layer doesn't mean it's bad or good top grain leather actually means at horween it's everything that they produce what the top grain leather is when i was talking about splitting it's actually the the leather on top that you have not removed from the bottom so when we go through the splitting process and make that even thickness you end up with two pieces you end up with a grain layer and something called a split which has no grain at all it's very suede and fibrous on both sides and again that's called a split you can make very fine leathers out of splits i think stead actually makes some really nice suedes out of splits that uh, are, are amazing in fact it's very difficult to do that and people love the the products out of them so just because something is uh, genuine leather, which I think uh, is, suede is also known, excuse me, splits are also known as genuine leather. Just because it, people think that genuine leather is bad, um, that doesn't really mean anything either. So the word genuine leather really has no descriptor to me. To me, like everything I work with is genuine leather. It doesn't really give me any information. Uh, so it's, it's troublesome when you see brands put on these words uh, just to try to sell products and it's very confusing. It's also very strange that again if you look at this huge chain of stuff we're talking about half of one of these boxes seem to determine what people think is high quality. What's up Marco? You actually work in the splitting department. <laughs> so you can uh, you can tell us what's up with there. You might also notice on that chart Shell Quarterman sort of bypasses a lot of these processes, which is very interesting to talk about. And it's almost like I have to have a separate tree altogether for the Quarterman because it's so unique of how they process it. So let's go back here. We've had the hide, we removed the hair, we cured it, we took out all the fats that are going to rot, and we thinned it down to an even thickness. So at this stage, if you don't do anything else, the leather will dry and essentially turn into a piece of cardboard or a potato chip. There's no nourishing fats and oils inside of the leather to make it flexible uh, and to make it look or feel like a leather that you might be familiar with again like if you don't do anything it's so so firm you, you can't even bend it and again we haven't put back in any nourishing oils and that's where the retanning process comes in so retanning uh horween leather in specific which is my familiarity horween leather is uh their emphasis and their probably biggest strength is this department is the retan and color department and this is where we impart 
characteristics into the leather as well as colors. So at, up to this point, you might even just have only chrome tan leather, which is all the same. This is the first stage of delineation where you can start to make that chrome tan leather into a football. You can make it into a piece of latigo. You can make it uh, into all sorts of different stuff. It, literally infinite possibilities from this stage. And to think of an analogy, it, it's a tough one. I can't really think of an analogy other than like, this is where you turn your blank canvas into like maybe just like one flat color and you can change it to a bunch of bunch of colors and then start building your subject on top of that background Th this color and retan is like your foundation almost the, the original tanning process is more of your foundation and the color and retan is where you, maybe you start to build your your framing of your house say so uh very important here this is where you can impart different oils so most oils that you find in leather tend to be animal products. Uh, well, you might be familiar with something like Neat's Foot Oil, which is typically more used in the finishing process. Uh, but there's also a little bit more modern types of fats um, uh, that are called fat liquors or emulsified oils. Uh, and you can impart those in this retaining process. Retaining is done in a large wooden drum. And the, Think of these wooden drums like a huge washing machine. So there's just a ton of water in it. In order to get the oils inside the leather, they need to, to be emulsified, uh, which means that they can be uh, the water can touch it and interact with it instead of the, them separating apart. And these emulsified oils will penetrate into the skin and, again, nourish all the fibers in there. There's another really incredible way, and I'll flip over my little slide here to the... <laughs> to show you the stuffing department and stuffing is another way where we can impart a little bit more raw oils and waxes into the leather without having to emulsify them so take a look at this chart really here on really closely here on the right side here you'll notice that chrome excel is retanned and colored and then it is stuffed so take a look really quick here So see how the hot stuffing is, is sort of like out of line? That's because not everything is hot stuffed. And again, it's just a way to impart waxes and oils into the leather. But these are these are things like, uh, like think about something like beeswax. Like how are you going to take a washing machine and wash your clothes and like get the beeswax to go inside your clothes? It won't. It will sort of just like sit on top. And what we're trying to do in this color and retanning department is to get it to go inside that mess of fibers. And that's, again, where hot stuffing comes in. So hot stuffing is also in a wooden drum. However, it is steam heated. So they heat up the drums really, really hot to the melting point of whatever wax and oil that they're trying to uh, impregnate into the leather. And then they'll tumble it and sort of beat the wax inside of the leather. So again, Shell Corbin, Chromexel, there's some really awesome leathers that have had oils and waxes applied in this method called hot stuffing. And then there's one other way where you can impart wax and oils into the leather. And this is a, a little bit more rare of a way, and it's called currying. I think of currying like I think of um, like a steakhouse aging a steak or something. So what currying is, is actually hand applied waxes and oils. Well, they'll they'll brush on uh, whatever material, wax oil, onto the grain layer and just let it sit there and cure. It takes a long time for these waxes and oils to sort of settle and even out, uh, which is why you don't find cur currying leather very often. It's because it takes a long time. It's just more expensive. So people don't tend to do it. Horween does some currying. If you're familiar with uh, Alden's 404 boots, the Kudu Chrome Excel boots, those are all curried leather. And the result of currying most times, like in that example, it really makes that Chrome Excel, Kudu Chrome Excel, super, super tough. But it also has a, a much uh, earthier sort of darkness to it. Uh, the curried leathers tend to be a little bit more uh, earthy and oily appearing in my experience. Um, 
And that's pretty much it. So color and retan, we're putting in, uh, we're changing the initial color of the leather. You can make it orange, pink, blue, black, leave it naturally and do nothing, as well as imparting its in, like main functional characteristics. This is where you make a leather waterproof. You can make a leather fireproof. You can impart resins into it. You can do so much stuff, but the main characteristics of the leather are all coming from this retanning department. After that, the leather is still super wet, so we have to remember uh, to dry it. And there's a couple different drying methods that are really, um, that people don't think about how the leather's dried. Uh, and they're very, very different results from different drying methods. So the, my favorite example is for one of my favorite leathers. Again, something that just takes longer, uh, but air drying the leather literally just putting it up on hooks and letting it dry in the air. Um, they actually will put some fans in there to dry it, uh, to expedite the drying a little bit. Um, but Chrome Excel is all air dried and it's, it takes about a week to 10 days, uh, which is a long time to let your customer wait <laughs> and it costs more money and they got to heat that room a little bit. So it's more expensive. And the other thing that's really crazy and the reason you don't see this is that the leather actually shrinks in on itself. Just like when you dry your clothes, you might notice uh, like your shirt might be a little tighter uh, once it's been dried. The things, uh, I don't know, cloth, I'm not super familiar with uh, textiles, but leather certainly shrinks back in on itself and it gets a little smaller, which is problematic as a business trying to sell things by the square foot. Most tanneries want to make leathers that are larger. So it, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot with that, but the reason that they do it is because it makes a better leather. Some people may have noticed Chrome Excel, uh, and I've certainly seen it, where there's loose areas of the hide, and uh, you get this sort of pipely, pipey, delaminated, pebbly sort of look on Chrome Excel. Not every piece of Chrome Excel is like that, and it's not like that. It might not be like that everywhere on the hide, but there's certain sections, often towards the bellies or the armpits or like the back legs of the animal or even like the necks where they tend to be a little bit more loose, those fibers aren't as tightly bound and the grain layer starts to separate and delaminate above that. You get that coarse sort of loose look. Generally speaking though, most Chrome Excel is pretty tight and that's because of the shrinking back in. I think, I think this is suspicion and we're talking about hot stuffing before, that heated up steam heated mill that's got pins in it, that's just beading the waxes and oils in there. I think that that process has a potential to sort of like overbeat the leather and it sort of loosens it up a little too much. I think sometimes you see a little bit of that or perhaps the waxes that they put in that stuffing drum are too hard of a wax and it creates like a, like imagine just like snapping a hard bar of wax. It, it, I think that same sort of thing happens in, in sometimes in the Chrome Excel where it's a little too hard and it just sort of cracks and that's why we get that delaminated pebbly look on the Chrome Excel. But that, I think the air drying and shrinking back of the Chrome Excel gives it a really interesting um, t like grain break to it. I, I tend to like it. In fact, the, uh, the boots I'm wearing right now have a really nice break to them on some natural Chrome Excel. Um, and the other interesting thing about it is uh, you tend to get um, a different grain characteristic. So the opposite end of the spectrum of air drying would be doing something like a vacuum drying. So for vacuum drying, imagine like I'm looking at a window right now, it's just a big sheet of glass. What they do is they actually lay down the leather on a big piece of glass and they, they decrease the pressure and heat it up. So it evaporates the moisture out of it. But when they're pressing this leather grain onto that glass, it actually flattens and compresses the grain character just a slight bit. Whereas the air drying, you, you have no nothing touching the glass. And it does give a different characteristic. There's another, there's there's two other ways that we dry that one is more similar to air drying and one is more similar to the vacuum drying. You may have seen, uh, if you're a leather worker, you may have seen some leathers with like these little clip marks. They, they sort of look like little lines in like a small rectangle towards the edge of the hide. Those are called toggling marks. And what it is, is there's these little clips that we call toggles that you clip onto the edge of the hide all the way around the edge and then you pull it across the frame so it dries while stretched out. Again, we want big area. We make money based on how large the hide is. So the larger and harder we can pull that, the more money the tannery is going to make. 
the toggling gives a very raised grain. It's a really interesting look, um, and it's too bad they don't have any examples here to show you. But the grain characteristic, when you have nothing pressing it while you dry it, is very different than when you press it down. It's almost like fluffier on the top layer. And I find that my favorite pebbled leathers, like a sort of natural pebble, tumbled uh, pebble, I find that toggled leathers with more of, um, I find toggled leathers to be better for pebble. I really, really like it. Uh, there's a leather called Dearborn from Horween that is uh, toggle dried and, and it's super soft and is incredible pebble and just like an amazing feel. If, if you felt the Dearborn before, it's really nice. I believe that there's an olive tan product that Horween makes. They might be making it for Wolverine right now that has a pebble grain. Uh, and I think they're also doing it for Allen Edmonds. But if you've seen some of those uh, deer tan leathers, uh, it's it's pretty nice. Baseball glove leather is also toggled. So if you have a baseball glove from Horween, you might be able to take a look at what I'm talking about. It's super, super grainy. And then the fourth wet method for drying is pretty crazy, but it's a method called pasting. And it's, uh, it's literally paste. <laughs> so it's exactly how it sounds. But it's, it's something I had never seen before. I would have never imagined. So what they do is they'll take that hide and they'll apply literally a layer of glue to the grain and then they press it up against a window, like a big piece of glass, and they'll spread it out and slick it down onto that piece of glass. Again, we want the largest area possible and it sort of stays on that frame and you can do it with heat to expedite the drying and, and run it through an oven and there's you can also just sort of let it air dry on that frame but you'll notice uh, if you ever see pasting or any sort of slicking out when they start to scrape the leather and push, push it against that glass it starts to s sort of squeegee out some of the liquid and that's uh, why they do it is they're, they're sort of extending the yield making it larger as well as removing some of the moisture it's sort of like pulling out the water from your hair in the shower or something like that. So at this stage, once the leather is dried, we now have something called a crust. And if you're a leather dork, you might have seen this word crust before and you're like, what? That's weird. Like, what does that even mean? Well, th that's what the stage we're at right now is we we've cured the leather, we've removed the hair, we've re-nourished it with oils, and then we've uh, maybe we've put in some dye and then we've dried it out. Now we have a crust so you could technically you could kind of stop right there and have a nice leather it might be a little firm because we haven't uh softened it up after drying uh, like if you wear raw, raw denim and, and wash your denim and let it dry you'll, you'll notice they're kind of firm uh, when you start to wear them again so they'll start to they might all you need to do is soften it and then you're good to go so sometimes some leathers like baseball glove leather you just soften it slightly on a process called staking uh, and then you send it out the door. And that's also known as naked, which means you haven't put any finish onto it. Naked leather is one end of the spectrum for finishing, which is the part we're going to talk about next. And the other end of the spectrum is something that I'd call a full finish or like a painted finish. The challenge for me talking about finishing is, again, because there's so many things that you can do. Uh, it's hard for me to make sort of like a linear path between all the steps. So what I can do is describe some of the different processes and, and some of the materials that they put on. But let me let me take a break here, uh, catch my breath, and then read uh, some of your comments here. And yeah, sorry that I haven't been around for um, for a live chat in a bit. I we we're having a hard time um, making product fast enough. I've got a kid now, and I'm I'm finding a hard time spending enough uh, time away from her. <laughs> it was a challenge. Um, and, you know, I've been, I just making excuses at this point. I just haven't had enough time. I'd really like to do more stuff here. And by the way, I've got a special surprise for everybody that sticks around at the end here. We'll give you a little announcement. Um, all right. What's your, uh, Bobo839 says, what's your opinion on bark tan leather? So, oak bark tan. Uh, it depends. I mean, I I have a feeling it's great. So, oak bark. It depends on what tanner you're talking about and what formulation they use. But generally speaking, I think it's great. I think you normally find that on leather soles for shoes. They tend to be the the ones that I'm familiar with tend to be super super firm. So I I tend to like them. 
I've been noticing recently, I, I think I'd be okay with giving up on, or giving away some of that durability of an extra firm outsole with a little bit more comfort, um, maybe a little bit more oiled. I'm wearing these trench boots from Oak Street right now. I don't know what they're using for their outsole, but it's certainly a softer leather veg. And it's, it's super, super comfortable. And it reminds me of my 1,000-mile boots, which are probably too far in the soft range and too thin. I think those are just a little too wimpy. Then even like the leather midsole on my Viber seem to be more substantial than the outsoles on these other ones I'm wearing now. So anyways, I like... I tend to like all veg tan. Uh, if you ask me, like, hey, what do you think about oak, oak bark? It's like, doesn't really tell me enough information. But I tend to, to like it. I know you can do a lot of really great tooling stuff with that, too. Uh, oh, Floyd knows about oak bark tannage. I love J and FJ Baker leather. Quite possibly my favorite. I'm not familiar with that. And Roger, I saw you chime in here uh, when I was talking about color and retan. It's like a primer. It's kind of like a primer. I think I was making a bad analogy. I was going down the wrong path there. And I appreciate, I appreciate that. I think, I think of uh, the leather like building a house. So I think about like the foundation of the leather, uh, like the foundation of your house is like the tanning process. So we have that initial base tannage, which could be chrome, it could be veg, and then we're going to frame it out above it. You know, that framing I think of as the retan and, and the color and retan department, and then the finishing department, which is the step we're at right now in the chain. Let me flip that over after this sentence. <laughs> but the finishing stage that we're at right now, I think of as the roof, maybe like, you know, the walls and the siding and stuff. This is sort of where you, you cap it off. But all your functional elements are sort of below the roof. Yeah. And thanks again for the, the feedback, because I'm trying, this is me practicing for a uh, podcast. I want to be able to, like, get my thoughts together in a concise way, and I tend to, I tend to get a little long-winded. But I think the house analogy might be good for this entire thing. But then talking about Cordovan, it's hard because I, I get too, too detailed down, like, an irrelevant path. And, like, lose the train of thought, which is why I made this chart. Um, Shell Cordovan gets it, it ha comes in as a hide where they remove the hair. They veg tan it in a pit with tree barks, and it doesn't go to splitting. Uh, it's a little different in that way. It doesn't get sorted. Like I said, was the most important part because you can't even see the shell at that point. So they have to start to they have to start to work with it before they can sort of shave down to take a look at the shell. Uh, Cordovan is really, really crazy, and people think it's a, a joke, or like I'm lying when I say it takes six months to make. It actually takes six months to make. And it does go through the hot stuffing process. I can't really talk a great detail about Cordovan uh, because I don't want to, I can't give away trade secrets. But there's a lot of stuff in there that that you'd be really surprised in terms of materials and in terms of processes. It's pretty wild how much work they do. It takes that long. And they also, a lot of the time too, is just letting it be. Like we were talking about the air drying for Chrome Excel. A lot of the stuff with the shell is you got to just let it sit there. It's like they were right on the, the, the job I had. I would actually make these little process travelers, the production tickets to go with a load of leather. And it would just literally say like, don't do anything. <laughs> just like, don't touch it. Just let it kind of sit there. And a lot of these leathers need a good amount of time to sort of mellow out and let those oils sort of migrate to where they want to be before you can continue to work with them. Oh, um, Andrew has a really good question and says, and, uh, Andrew says, what do you think about mushroom leather, other leather alternatives? I kind of don't, honestly, like, I don't, they don't bother me. I don't tend to seek them out. And I also think, you know, they probably shouldn't be called leather. I would mean, just call it something else. Because to me, leather is like a really specific thing. You know, we're starting to talk about 
finishing in a second here, and it's also to my point, finishing is like, don't paint it because you might as well just use another material. Like I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want my leather to be covered in, in things that take away from its natural character. That's my vibe though. A lot of people really like a flat, even consistent thing. Um, but to me, it just seemed a little counterintuitive. It's just like use plastic or something else. Like if you don't care, um, I like the idea that <clears throat> I like the idea for for leather alternatives um, because I think you know we got some climate issues going on, and I think that um, you know what? Actually, I'm going to take that back because I don't think. The hide the leather industry is not driven by demand for leather. It's it's pushed by the demand for meat. You know, people are eating beef and then they got to figure out what to do with the hides and then they sell the hides. I have heard an interesting counterpoint to my thought process, which is, yeah, they sell the hides so they can subsidize the meat a little bit. So you're sort of indirectly supporting the meat industry. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it's it, you're never going to win, right? Um, but I think it's interesting. I, I like the idea of people trying new stuff. I just don't know, like, is it really leather at that point? But I think it's cool. Gig. Uh, Gig says, long time, no talk, Phil. Great to see you again one of these days. i got to hit you up at Hori for a tour. Yes, you should. <clears throat> Although I don't know if they're doing tours just yet. We're technically, you know, I'm still supposed to be wearing a mask, which people have been commenting on our videos from a year ago when we all had to wear masks and telling me like I'm a showboating masks or something. It's really strange how people are these days. <laughs> like I'm just wearing a mask because the government told me to and I have to. Um, what's up Thestavia? Uh, Tobias says, how do I make leather from <laughs> oh, no. psoriasis scabs? Uh, you could you could just cure it that's really gross, though. You could just, like, get all the moisture out and just, like, s just put a ton of salt on it. Um, <laughs> I'm not a leather chemist. That's the other thing is, like, I don't, I don't know how these things work on a chemical level. I, I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if you'd want to do that regardless. Uh, um, has Ashlyn made dress belts? If yes, is it possible to make a custom order? We don't really do dress belts. Um... If you like Cordovan, you might want to take a look at Genuine Horween products. I know that he sells some Cordovan belts that, that I don't make. Uh, A51NXM17X says, Hey Phil, Hugh here. So happy you could finally catch one of your streams. I'm glad that you could too. Robert says, When designing your products, do you usually have a particular leather in mind when designing to incorporate the properties into the leather characteristic of the product? Yes. So... That's like the that's the ultimate question, uh, Robert. That's the the whole question um, for anybody working with leather. And I think that's again like why I turn the camera on and talk about it is because this word leather is sort of an encompassing mystery enigma. It's like what does that mean? And that's why I want to walk through all the steps. So a really good example of of this is a great question, Robert. There's a wallet that we make called Johnny the Fox that, that has a couple specific challenges as a leather crafter. And just as a wallet wearer, you know, I could make you a Johnny the Fox out of belt weight leather and you'd have a, a wallet this thick, but nobody really wants that. People think, a lot of our customers think that a thicker leather is inherently more durable. That's not necessarily the case. It, it, it's almost like like saying my wallet is made out of titanium it's stronger than steel it's like yeah but they're both never gonna break <laughs> you're never gonna break it um, the, the bigger thing is uh, for thinking about what leather choice to use when making a product is thickness is really important and then characteristics like strength so again Johnny the Fox we had to make a specific leather and Horween custom made it for us for the interior of that wallet, there's eight layers. Yeah, there's eight layers of leather that uh, all sit on top of each other. And you know, one millimeter adds up to eight pretty quickly, and that's kind of thick. So we needed a leather 
that would be really thin and inherently so. And when I say that, I mean, I don't want to take a thick steer hide and thin it down to be that one millimeter thick that I want or even 0.8 millimeters. Because if you start to remove some of that foundation and the framing of your house, you ruin all the strength and your roof just collapses in <laughs> to continue the analogy. So we had to make a naturally thin leather that didn't have any stretch. That's the other thing about a lot of our wallets is we don't want those card holders to become sort of loose and floppy inside. We want them to have a nice bit of stand. So we made a leather called Latigo on the horse hides and the Latigo is a combination tanned leather that is paste dried and it on the horses it's just naturally thinner. So the Latigo being a combination tan with a veg it's combination tan is chrome tan base with a veg tan retanage. You get that strength of the of the Latigo as well as the rigidity that you receive from a vegetable tanning which is helping lend to us not having a lot of uh, a lot of stretch and a little bit more compact density to the veg character in it. And then by pasting the leather up on those frames and, and sort of pushing out and spreading out the leather very hard onto these glass frames, uh, we're reducing the amount of stretch. Um, and then the, just the natural thickness of the horse, uh, they tend to be inherently thinner than most other animals. Uh, at least the animals that Horween works with, which is limited. They only do bovine and, and equine. Yeah, that's all they really do. So that's how we chose that leather. Um, now, if I was going to make a boot, I like the Chrome Excel. So, but I like, here's what I like about, I'm noticing that I like about specific boots now is, we're talking about the air drying on the Chrome Excel. I noticed that it, it sort of envelops my foot and molds to my foot a little bit better. And my suspicion is that it's doing that because it was air dried. And uh, when I start to stretch it out, it has like a little bit of give to it. So I, maybe I want a little stretch on, on other products. Um, we should talk about waterproofing, which I think is a total waste of time. Um, you can make a water, a uh, leather waterproof in theory, uh, but it doesn't last. And if you put a little drop of soap on it, you ruin the whole waterproof. To me, like I have boots that I want to wear in the water. They're not leather. I just use rubber boots or I have hiking boots from REI that are great. And they have a different function for me. I don't wear them. Uh, I don't need to have leather everything. You don't have to have leather all the time. But uh, the I think it might be a dirty secret, but leather is only rated for a certain amount of flexes. So it's literally like two days worth of walking, then technically your boots are not waterproof anymore. According to the spec, they might last longer than that, but there's a spec that a tannery has to hit. And I think it's a little bit nonsense. But that's a really good question. Hopefully I answered that. It, it's complicated because you can do a lot of different stuff. Uh, and then we'll talk about finishing too. And I got a roll here. I got to go pick up my daughter. Uh, Josh says, "Hey, I'm enjoying the show Cordovan Wallet I got recently. I'm glad that you, that you enjoy it, Josh." And what's up, Stephen? <coughs> Robert says, "My first wallet from Ashland was going to be a Johnny the Fox, but you were sold out. I'm grateful though because you hate Capones. You probably mean I have Capones, and it encouraged me to to try to yeah." I, I enjoyed wearing my Capone. I really liked it. Uh, it's back here still. I was surprised, actually, how much I liked the Capone. I really enjoyed that wallet. All right, let's finish off uh, finishing, and then uh, I'll give you our super secret. And everybody that's hung in here so far, thank you so much. I, I could use some tips of topics to focus in more on for this uh, podcast I'm doing, so if you have any suggestions for me, uh, I appreciate it. All right, so we have the crust. And again, just to recap, we had a hide. It could be any type of animal. We removed the hair. We cured it. We split it down and thinned it down to a specific thickness that we, we require for our final product. We re-nourished those fibers with different oils and waxes. And then we added some color, maybe. And then we dried it in one of our four different drying methods. Now we have our crust. And again, I think of the crust as more of like a blank canvas. This is where we can start to apply different finishes to it. 
and there's a couple different types of ways that you can apply finish. Um, look at my notes here. Not, uh, not worth showing you. <laughs> but you can apply color in a few different ways. You can spray the color on. You can brush it on like you might paint your wall. Uh, and, and, and there's also another application called a roll coating machine, which is, is not a it's, a, it's like a brush, but it doesn't have uh, texture to it. It's like a flat rubber roller. And you can roll that onto, uh, onto leathers. <clears throat> and then there's a couple, there's two different types of methods of color that you can apply. I don't know how to put that a little bit better, but there's two things that you can apply to achieve different colors. It's a probably better way to put it. You can apply dye to the leather and stains, or you can apply pigments. And what's the difference? And it's a little confusing, but there's, to me, the biggest difference is if you took a dye and applied it to a, a light piece of wood, you would still see all of that wood character in the wood itself, but you would just be changing the tint a little bit. Maybe you put a little bit of red on it. You might see some of that red, but you can still see right through that dye and that stain down to the natural character of the wood. Whereas a pigment has much more solids in the finish. And it's a lot more like paint. So if you were to put a pigment finish over a piece of wood, you might be it might be impossible to see through that pigmented finish into the natural character of the leather. It might start to look a little bit more like paint. And that's the biggest difference to me. Uh, the other thing, functionally, technically, I would say pigment is much better because it's very even and flat and it's super consistent. Where dyes tend to be a little bit more variable. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to control. Some products you may or may not want a consistent look. At Ashland, we want a very natural appearance. So we tend to go either naked leathers or we tend to go with uh, lightly stained leathers. There's a um, very successful, nice products made by uh, Gucci or whatever, where they're putting a full, full finish, and it's super consistent every time. It's really nicely done. It's just a completely different vibe. It's it's a little bit more uh, sterile, I would say. A lot of the Italian leathers I've noticed tend tend to be fully finished. So you can put that color on, but we also need to finish it in the same way that you would finish your car or again a piece of wood. So we've only changed the color and we can apply a top coat to the leather as well. But we need to put something between that dye or pigment and the top coat above it. There's a little bit of a sandwich of layers and it's called, actually called a finish system. So we've got the stain coat or pigment coat. You actually have a binder coat in between and then your top coat on top. That binder coat is, is super important because it's going to hold your top coat in place on top of the dyes. And Binder coats are more or less the same. You can make them like kind of sticky. You can make them release. So when your your leather goods starts to get scuffed up, it will purposefully release the top coat a bit to give you a little bit of a, an effect. Or maybe you want your binder coat to be really weak. So when you tumble the leather, some of that finish comes off in little sections and it gives you a cool effect. You can do different things with binders. They're not terribly exciting to think about. Top coats, you can do a ton of stuff with. I can give you a top coat that's really dull. I can give you a top coat that's really bright. I can give you a top coat that will resist uh, UV light so it won't change the color of anything underneath. I can give you a top coat that has a really silky feel. You can do a lot of different stuff with the top coat. And I visualize a top coat like a, it literally looks like plastic uh, once they spray it on. Uh, or if you were to look at a sample of you know what just a sprayed piece of top coat looks like, imagine just like a, a little plastic disc. That's what a top coat is, just bound to the the leather underneath. If uh, fifty one MXM seventeen says, "Would a hand sanitizer strip from strip from shell? Would hand sanitizer strip? It should actually. Um, like alcohol will make." Uh, dyes dilute a little bit. It's like thinner. Uh, you'll thin it out. It might be pretty hard to remove a lot of color from the shells. They, they put a lot of dye on there. Uh, but I'd imagine if you spend enough time, you could probably rub finish off with some alcohol. <clears throat> um, so we've applied some stain. We did a binder coat or an adhesion coat, and then we put a top coat. At that point, you still need to sort of smooth it out. That, that top coat layer 
won't really achieve the effect that you want until it's been pressed with a little bit of heat and a texture. And we do that in a machine called a plating machine. The most common plates that you'll see um, look like a, a mirror. So it'll give you a bright, shiny luster if you just press a hot mirror onto the top coat and give it a little bit of pressure uh, and some dwell time. It will create a bright, shiny look, especially if you used a bright top coat. Maybe if you wanted a little bit more dull, you might use a plate called a sandblast plate with a little bit less heat and it won't give you and less pressure, and it won't give you as much of a, a bright look. And then a very common plate that is used. This is also known as embossing. You can use a plate called a hair cell, and a hair cell is really is interesting because it it does a pretty good job of replicating what the natural grain character of the animal looks like. So a, a tannery to make some money might take a split, a byproduct of another tannery, and then fill in all those fibers with a bit of resin or had like super heavy amount of resin, pigment the crap out of it and paint it, and then they'll put a hair cell in it and a nice top coat over top. And you might be able to fool 99% of people to thinking that looks uh, like a genuine, like real full grain piece of leather. Um, so there's ways that a finishing department can upgrade uh, leather to make it a little bit more consistent. Um, and then there's other things like embossing is, is sort of like that plating where you can put other textures in. You might have seen us do it with, uh, we have like a lizard texture, the Western texture. There's the box board texture. Those are all embossing. You can finish on top of that embossing in different ways. It's just something called inlaying. You can polish the grain of the leather, which Chrome Excel has a polished grain. There's another process called boarding that I would like to get into. And a topic that I talk about a lot is aniline leather. We were talking about earlier before we start finishing. All leather that is crust is aniline leather. There's, uh, In fact, it's not even aniline. It's naked. Once you put a little bit of dye or stain on it with no solids in the finish, that is still aniline leather. So to me, aniline is that analogy of like a stained piece of wood versus a painted piece of wood. You can see through the finish down to the natural character, that's aniline. And I think that's another marketing term that gets spun around at people and they don't know what it means. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean good or bad. It's just a, a thing. Uh, and then after that, the leather gets graded and sorted and we can get into grading a bit, but I gotta go. <laughs> but hopefully that was helpful. I wanted to, uh, if you guys, I, I'll read these comments later. So if you have any tips or suggestions, things for me to dwell on, and more, on a little bit more, maybe I start to talk about something that you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, give me a couple bullet points of things that you thought were cool. And then I can sort of emphasize that in this interview I'm doing next week. But everybody that stuck around, uh, there's a couple 20, what, 22 people here right now? I'm not sure. Um, here's the heads up, the secret heads up, is uh, we're going to be doing a, how do I show this to you? We're going to be doing some private stock, and it's going to go live on Monday. As soon as it, you know what, as soon as I turn this video off, I'll just publish that video. You're going to see a private stock preview of about 45 different items. So let's see. There's a couple leathers that we've never done before. Um, where were they? There's actually a, a new inverted color, the inverted black shell. Uh, it's really cool. I think that's the first wallet that you'll see in the video. There's some really, really awesome long wallets. Uh, there's a long wallet in all Western cigar shell cordovan that's beautiful. There's one in magenta shell with marbled magenta shell. That's something we don't see very often. And there's a bunch of tumbled shells as well uh, that are really neat. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of violet. Oh, the other one that's really, really cool is there's a, um, there's a psychedelic green and purple that will be in there uh, that I'm really psyched on. And then we ran out of Lux leather and we did a pre-order for earlier this year. There's a couple different Lux items in here too that I thought were really nice. It kind of makes me want to get some more Lux. Oh, and a tumbled verdigree. There's a tumbled verdigree Herbie in there that's like ridiculous. I mean, I'm looking at my list here. There's just like so many cool things. Uh, anyways, I will publish that video right now. Um, 
as soon as they turn the stream off. So I encourage you to check it out. It's going to go live on Monday, the 8th of November at noon my time, which is central time in Chicago. So it's, you know, 10 a.m. in on the Pacific and 1 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, but thank you guys uh, so much. Uh, A51NX uh, says, what hand sanitizer strip color from Shell? I'm always super careful when using hand sanitizer to make it completely dry. I would make it, I would dry your hands before, you, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put too much alcohol on the leather. It, it, the other thing that you might see happen on a veg leather like shell is sometimes different minerals, I've noticed when it interacts with the shell can sort of like puff up the leather in certain spots, which I don't love. And I wonder if the alcohol might have that same sort of interaction. So I, I would, yeah. Oh, the pH level. It's actually, the leather is actually pretty acidic. Uh, I don't, I'm not much of a chemist, but I know they have to change the pH levels to get the tanning uh, salts to go in and then bind it in there and then they, they shock it again with a different pH and it binds everything together. But hey, uh, thanks thanks so much guys. I appreciate any feedback you give me. Thanks for coming to hang out. Check out the, um, the video I'm about to post uh, if you want to see some private stock stuff. It's really sweet. Thanks.